Hello everyone, in 5.5 we're going to talk about trig equations. So essentially it's just an equation that contains a trig expression but has a variable. And in math we're always solving for the value of the variable, right? Whatever value makes that equation true, then that's what we consider a solution. Here in the trig equations that we're going to work with, we will consider um, the values that make the equation true, right? So those are the values that are true for some equation. <clears throat> Whatever satisfies the equation we're working on, it's considered a solution. So basic, kind of like what you would do in college algebra. Um, same as in college algebra, we have some equations that don't have solutions, right? So not every equation will have a solution. So we have to be kind of smart about those things. So for example, say that we're solving sine of x equals to one half. So, you know, entry level type of thinking, you will kind of recall the unit circle Okay, we have the unit circle. For example, sine of x equals to one half. So you're thinking of the values of x that when you plug them into sine, give you one half. So one way of thinking is looking back at the unit circle and thinking at which points or which angles uh, is sine one half. And so remember that a smart trig class or all students take calculus or whatever you do to remember in the first quadrant, all of the functions are positive. In the second quadrant, sine only is positive. So we're looking at first and second quadrant, right? If you if you remember, right? So x can be pi over six, which is some angle here, but then also over here right which we can find by doing pi minus pi over 6 and this comes out to be 5 pi over 6 so we have two solutions that satisfy this equation okay so you know at a very basic level that's all that we have to do okay Then, you know, let's let's talk about some tips or some methods to better solve these types of equations. <clears throat> so, whenever you have a single trig function in an equation, what you want to do is pretty much isolate the function on one side of the equation, right? So, move everything out to the other side, and then solve for the variable, right? Kind of like you would do in algebra. So let's go ahead and do that here. We have two times cosine of x plus one equals two. Well, move that, oops, move the one to the other side. And divide by two. And we're left with cosine of x equals to one half. So, you know, go back to the unit circle explanation. And all students take calculus or a smart trick class. And you see that up here, cosine is one half. 
But where else is cosine positive? Because this is a positive one half. So only in fourth quadrant is well, first and fourth quadrant is cosine positive. So in the first quadrant we have x equals two pi over three. But then we have to do two pi minus pi over 3 to see what we get as our second solution so this will give us 5 pi over 3 as the second solution right so we get two places where cosine is equals to 1 half Okay, now there is something that we have to stop and think about. Are these the only solutions or are these solutions unique? So I think it's better to just ask the question about are they the only solutions? So for sine of x equals to one half, we found, you know, pi over six as the only solution for sine of x equals to one half for the other example of two times cosine of x plus one equals to two we asked the question is pi over three the only solution and if we scroll back up i mean we got two solutions so definitely pi over three is not the only solution and like i have here in the red the answer is no for both solution for both examples it is not right the answer is no those answers are not unique or those are not the only answers so what follows is to ask yourself why why is that not the case well maybe you already have an idea as to what I'm about to say right so sine and cosine are both what we call periodic functions, right? They, they're a wave that goes up and down and it goes on forever, all the way to the left and all the way to the right. So what it means is that there are infinitely many solutions or many values of X for which sine of X is equals to one half, okay? So here in the graph, I have the function y equals sine of x right so that's the graph of sine and here in the purple i have the value y equals one half so every time they intercept like right here right there That is a solution to our equation. Okay, so, so far I can only show eight solutions because my graph is only that picture, right? So, is it only eight solutions, right? And the question is no again there are infinitely many values of x, right? So here, on this dot right here, we had um, pi over six, right? And then we had five pi over six right there. So the next question that should be kind of coming to your mind is, how do I represent this? You know, how do I show all of the solutions you know how can we kind of have a system to show all of the solutions so the answer to that is right here so let's say that we want to find all of the solutions between 0 and 2 pi right so here well the first step first is to find all of the solutions between 0 and 2 pi 
So once we do that, which we already did in the previous steps, right, uh, the solutions are sine of x equals to 1 half. Well, the solutions to that equation are x equals pi over 6 and x equals 5 pi over 6. So those are the only two solutions that we have between 0 to 2 pi. So what, you know, how do we figure out the other ones? Well, any multiple of 2 pi can be added to these solutions. So whenever you add a multiple to it, it gives you another solution. So you have two points which you can add multiples of. So here, the infinitely many solutions that we can find can be represented by these two equations here, or these two expressions, right? x can be equal to pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, or 2 n pi, right? And x equals 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, meaning that you can let n be equals to negative 1. You know, if that was the case, what is x going to be? Then if we do that, then x is equals to pi over 6 minus 2 pi, okay? And so what is that equal to? That is going to be pi over 6 minus 12 pi over 6. And this gives me negative 11, oops, negative 11 pi over 6. So, okay. And, you know, you can let n be any number. Positive, negative, whatever you want it to be. Okay. Uh, then we can do pretty much any problem at this point, right? Another example that we need to cover is solving an equation with what we call multiple angle. So notice how it says tangent 3x, meaning three times whatever the angle that you're going to plug in equals to 1, okay? So that's what we have to con consider. So first thing that we need to kind of know is that the period of tangent is equals to pi. Right, so in In the interval 0 to pi, the only Okay, so if you want tangent of any value to equals 1, it has to be pi over 4, right? That is the only place between 0 to pi where the function tangent is going to equals 1. Okay, so what does it mean? It means... three x has to equal pi over four. Okay, so because the period 
is only pi then the way to represent all of the solutions are going to be the following 3x is going to be equal to pi over 4 plus some multiple of pi, a number n times pi. And then x is going to be equal to, we want to multiply everything, not multiply, but divide everything to the other side by 3, so we get the following. Okay, so we get this general answer, right? We have x is equal to pi over 12 plus some multiple of pi divided by 3, right? So in the interval from 0 to 2 pi, not including it, there are several answers. So let's go ahead and figure out those several answers. So if you let n equals to 0, then we have x is equal to pi over 12, right? I guess I'll plug it in so you can see. Okay, so that's one answer. Then, if we let n equals 1, that's too difficult to see or to write with. So n equals 1, then we have x is equal to pi over 12 plus pi over 3. So how do we put that together? Pi over 12 plus multiply both top and bottom by 4. So we got 4 pi over 12 and that is equal to 5 pi over 12. Okay. Uh, I'm only doing this because the indications here say that x has to be between 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so if we had no bounds as to where my x value can be, then all I would have to do is come up with a general solution. Okay, then x equals 2. So you get the idea, right? We're doing all of these numbers up until getting to really close to 2 pi. Okay. Uh, this is going to be 2 pi over 3, pi over 12, plus 8 pi over 12, right? Because if I multiply both top and bottom by 4, then this becomes 9 pi over 12. And this is the same thing as if I divide both top and bottom by 3. So 3 pi over 4. Then, let's circle through and use purple again. So n equals 3, x is equals to <coughs> pi over 12 plus 3 pi over 3. And that cancels out pi over 12 plus pi, but then I need denominator of 12, so I'm going to multiply both top and bottom by 12, and I am left with 13 pi over 12. 
then n equals 4, I have x equals to pi over 12 divided by, oops, what am I doing? Uh, plus 4 pi over 3, multiply both top and bottom by 4, so I have pi over 12 plus 16 pi over 12, and if I add the numerators, I get 17 pi over 12. I may be running out of space here, but that's all right. We're almost done. And then we have n equals to 5. So x is equals to pi over 12 plus 5 pi over 3. Multiply both top and bottom by 4. Pi over 12 plus 20 pi over 12. We get 21 pi over 12, which turns into 7 pi over 4. Now, I'm going to move a little bit to the right and show you the last example, the last value. So we have n equals 6. So x is equals to pi over 12 plus 6 pi over 3. And this becomes pi over 12 plus 2 pi. So I don't have to go any farther here just to see that this last value, this last solution, is going to be outside of the bounds, right? Because if I'm adding this value to 2 pi, it's going to put me outside of the, of the interval that I was given for the initial solution. So, in other words, all the way up until n equals 5 is where the solutions actually happen. So I don't have to do any more. It only has six solutions. So there are only six places between 0 to 2 pi where tangent equals 1. Um, but more specifically, these are the x values that when I multiply them by 3, then when I plug them into tangent, give me 1. Okay. Next, um, what if my trig equation has some kind of quadratic form? Um, what does that mean? You may be wondering. Uh, this, right? Two times cosine square of x plus cosine x minus one equals to zero. Here, what you could do, or the way that you may want to see it is that you could do a u substitution, right? Notice how this in the purple looks very similar to a regular quadratic equation, right? And whenever we have a quadratic equation that is equals to zero, we can use quadratic formula or we can do some factoring, right? So again, my solution or my x values should be between zero and two pi. So let's go ahead and go for that. So I'm gonna let cosine of x be equals to u. Right, I'm just going to do some substitution so that it looks a little easier for us to solve. So once again, 2 times u squared plus u minus 1 equals to 0. So I'm going to do some factoring, right? I'm going to break this thing apart into some of its factors. So I know that I'm going to do 2u here, a u here, 
and I need some things to multiply to 1, right? So here's a 1, and here's a 1. Now they need to add to a positive in the middle, so we can try this combination. And you know, I always recommend to foil back and double check. Make sure that what you did makes sense, right? So this times this and this times that, right? Just so we know what's going on. So let's do a quick check. 2u square plus 2u minus a single u minus 1. Uh, this right here is what I'm concerned about. This becomes just a single u and it looks like the original. So we're good. We don't need this work. And here, I have these two things being multiplied to each other and they equal zero. So we can use the zero product property. So we're gonna set it aside equals to zero. So I'm gonna solve for u. So plus one, plus one, two u equals one, u equals to one half. So that's the first part. And then there's also a u plus one equals zero. So I subtract one, and then I have u equals to negative one. Um, but don't forget that I'm not really solving for u. I'm looking for x. So I gotta go back to the original form. And remember, u was really cosine of x. We just changed it so that it was easier for us to see. So now we have this cosine of x equals to one half cosine of x equals to negative one so what can we do now um, cosine of x equals negative one happens only when x is equals to pi right so that hopefully is an easy one and then cosine of one half so we did that one earlier and think about the whole unit circle thing where it happened up here the cosine is one half but it also happens down here where you do two pi minus whatever the solution is up there so x is equals to pi over three and also 5 pi over 3. So in this case, we have three solutions that happen between 0 and 2 pi. Okay? Alrighty. Next. Uh, we want to use factoring in order to separate different functions, right? So here we have a combination of tangent and sines and to some different power. So it may seem kind of strange, right? How do we do this? How do we solve for x when there are all these different functions here? So Let's go ahead and do that. What we want to do is move all the terms to one side. So I'm going to rewrite the problem and I'm going to move that three tangent x to the left side. So I'm, that means I subtract it three tangent x from both sides, right? So I'm here in my second step, my third step, you know, what do I do? Well, notice that both have a tangent, right? Some kind of value of tangent. Well, that means I can factor out a tangent, right? So I can rewrite this as tangent x times sine square of x minus three and all of that equals zero. So just like we did before, we're going to do 
zero product property in some sense, right? Where two things are being multiplied to each other and give you zero, well, set them equal to zero and solve for x. So we have the following, right? Tangent of x equals to zero. Well, there are two places where tangent of x equals zero. Because remember, tangent is the same thing as sine over cosine, if that makes it easier for you to remember. And if you look at the unit circle, sine is zero here when x is zero, or here when x is equal to pi, or 180 degrees. So if we look at that, then x is equals to 0 or x is equals to pi. So that one is not the most concerning solution. Sine square of x minus 3 is the problem and let's see why. So we solve right we have this but then we have sine square and how do we get rid of a square? Um, just like we do in algebra, we take the square root of both sides and we have sine of x is equals to plus or minus the square root of three. So what is the square root of three uh, as an approximation? I'm more concerned about the approximation of it. And so the approximation of it is 1.73. So sine of x claims to be equal to 1.73. But if you look at the unit circle, right, the radius of this is one. So the largest output that you could ever get by inputting anything into sine has to be one or negative one. So, therefore, this does not count as a solution. Alright, using identities to solve a trig equation is going to be something that we need to be able to do. Not every problem is going to be solved in this form, but some problems look very difficult uh, and we may need to rewrite things in order to make it easier. So this has a cosine power two, and you could say, was well, this a quadratic type of problem? And the answer is no, because they both need to be the same function in order for you to solve it as a quadratic. So for us, in this case, we have to use one of the identities in order to turn it into either uh, both functions at cosine or both functions as a sine. So uh, let's try to think of a function that we can rewrite cosine square of in terms of sine. So let's go ahead and work on that. Two cosine square of x plus three sine of x equals to zero. So what we're gonna do is replace cosine square of x with one of those identities. And one of the identities I'm going to use is going to be sine square of x. Okay, so one minus sine square of x is the same thing or it's equivalent to cosine square of x. So the rest is going to stay as it is. Then I want to simplify things a little, because right now it's a little bit messy, right? So I'm going to do distribution. So I have 2 minus 2 sine square of x plus 3 sine of x equals to 0. So now it's looking a little bit better. Well, kind of. <clears throat> so we have negative 2 sine square of x 
plus 3 sine of x plus 2 equals 0. So now it is a quadratic, right? It fits the quadratic form where every function here is the same kind. Now it's all signs, but we have a problem with the first term, right? It's a negative number. So what we can do is multiply everything or multiply the equation by negative one, right? Because it's easier to factor a positive coefficient than it is to factor a negative one. So multiply everything by negative one. So all that we're doing now is just swapping the signs. Okay, cool. So if you want to look at it this way, two, u squared minus 3u minus 2, uh, you can, right? And if it's easier, then I suggest you do that, right? Because then if we factor this, we get something like this. I know that I need a 2u here and perhaps a single u here. Um, and then we have to think, you know, is it 2 and 1 here, or is it 2 and then the 1 here? So we have to figure that out and make sure we get the right values in the right spot, and then also the right signs. So the real answer is positive 1 here, negative 2 here. So try to understand why do foiling, you know, distribution in order to verify that you've placed the values in the correct spot. And once we have that, I'm going to go back and substitute my function, right? So 2 sine of x plus 1 times sine of x minus 2. And this is all equals to 0. And I feel like I'm running out of space. So I'm going to just push everything back up here. Okay, I'm going to split things and set them equal to zero individually. So I have 2 sine of x plus 1 equals zero, but then I also have sine of x minus 2 equals zero. Right? Uh, we are setting each factor equals to zero on its own. Then I'm going to solve Right, I have 2 sine of x equals negative 1. I have sine of x equals to negative 1 half. And then also sine of x equals to positive 2. So I think we've been in that situation before. So this equation on the right side does not have a solution because there is no value of x that you could plug in that gives you two as an output, right? We already talked about that. The maximum output or the minimum and maximum output that you can get is between negative one and one, right? At least for sine of x. So going back to the other equation, where can we get negative one half? Um, well, remember, sine is only positive in the first and second quadrant so this negative one half solution is going to be here in the fourth and third quadrant right somewhere here imagine that there is a unit circle here something like that and so we now have to figure out what is that value that we could plug in for x, okay? So one way to do it, if you don't know, is that sine of pi over six gives us one half for sine, right? So you could do two pi minus pi over six. And so this is two pi well, actually 12 pi over 6 minus pi over 6, and we get 
11 pi over 6. And that's this value down here in the fourth quadrant. So that is one of the solutions. Then what about the other value, Okay, which is this one right here in the third quadrant? And all you have to do is pi plus pi over 6. And so we get 7 pi over 6 as both of our solutions. Okay, 11 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6 are the only two solutions that work for this equation and whose values are between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, and that's all of the different types of examples that I have for section 5.5 and this is solving trig equations uh, using uh, many different methods.